Divine Truth Interviews. Jesus, Mary, and others are interviewed by members of the media and the public. Jesus is interviewed by Mary Magdalene on the topic of emotions. The interview was held on the 4th of June, 2014, in Wilsdale, Queensland, Australia. This is Session 7. Welcome everyone to Session 7 of our series on emotions. I'm here again today with Jesus, who is going to be answering some of your questions that you've sent in on the topic of emotions and feelings. Before you proceed, though, with watching this section of the questions, we really recommend that you, if you haven't already, go back and watch the human souls. We did three sessions on the human soul, and those sessions provide a really good introductory framework to what we are now continuing to talk about. So we recommend you view those before you view what we're about to speak about today. And also if you have, uh, if you're wanting a more basic introduction to some of the, the grounding information or the information that we're building upon in this series, we recommend you watch, watch se session two and three of this series on emotions and feelings. So today, we're continuing on with this series with personal questions that people have sent in to us and we hope that you find it really helpful and enjoyable. Over the past five years, I've come to stand up to the negative baggage of so-called family and friends weighing me down. <laughs> it was actually a psychologist, another type of life coach, <laughs> who urged me to make the tough decision to get rid of those these negative forces, regardless of whether they were coming from my mother, my best mate, or a colleague. Mm. I've done so and now find myself with virtually no one in my life. Mm. <laughs> Although I feel less stress and negativity in my life, it's left me completely at a loss to understand where to next. Yeah. Well, firstly, I think the life coach that he, or psychologist that uh, recommended these particular things to this man, I think it is, um, did a good job with, with him, with his recommendations. We always want to make sure that if people are attempting to pull us down, being negative in our lives and so forth, we do want to make sure that at some point in time we make it clear to those people that we're not going to put up with that kind of treatment because it is actually quite abusive type of treatment. So, so I feel the psychologist or the life coach gave him very, very good advice but the only problem with most of these pieces of advice is that they don't focus on the soul at all. Mm -hmm. They focus on doing something rather than fixing something in the soul itself. And this is the problem that this man faces. When we fix something in the soul, things change in our life. And what will happen is when, when we start to remove uh, people who have been negative in our life away from our life, and we actually work through the soul-based emotions regarding that, what will happen is eventually those people will not be attracted to us at all anyway. Mm. So eventually so, they get to the point where they don't, we don't even attract people who are negative into our lives anymore. Then we go through this period generally where we now don't really understand what to do <laughs> because we're yet to attract positive people into mm. our life and we're yet to uh, take some kind of personal steps, again, emotional, that we need to take in order to attract positive people into our lives. And this is what ha has happened to this man. So what's happened here is that, is that he has been, he, the recommendation to him to remove the negative people, which was a great recommendation, mm -hmm. he's followed through with action without actually releasing the emotions that caused the attraction to these people in the first place. Sure. Now, while you do that, you won't be attracting new people into your life and there will still be a tendency of those people who are negative coming into your life. It will just be different people who are negative coming into your life. And of course, you'll ask them to get out of your life as well. And so this net result will be that you'll end up with no people in your life or mm -hmm. very few people in your life. And that's an indication that you haven't done the soul work needed that needs to be done in, with regard to the people that you have removed from your life. So what I would recommend firstly is to, is to start looking at what emotions within this man would be, would be still causing the attraction to be that either no one or no one positive comes into his life. 
And these are usually based, these attractions, these soul-based attractions are all based around emotions and they're all based around emotions from our childhood. Mm -hmm. And and so therefore they are things that he is going to have to work through with his mother and father, both, both, both genders, with regard to what, what kind of oppression he felt during his childhood, what, what before then was causing him to allow the oppression even as an adult by these people, and, and what feelings he has about those particular things. And what's happened is he has not truly felt about these things. If he truly feels about these things, what he will find happening is he will release from himself the emotions that cause the attraction, so he will no longer have to take the action anymore to prevent these kind of people from being in his life because they will automatically no longer be attracted to his life. Mm. And he will also then start attracting people who are more positive. Now, in terms of the group of emotions he needs to experience, well, that's, a, again, another discussion in itself because there are a large group of emotions that a person needs to go through and experience if they are in a place where they have removed negative people from their life but not attracted any positive people. And these kind of emotions generally are related to the negative people themselves Mm -hmm. and what kind of things he feels about that. So there's feelings associated with loneliness, uh, hopelessness and other kinds of emotions. There's also feelings where there is this still internal allowance of negative behaviour towards oneself. So that's a lot about one's self-esteem and self-worth and working through childhood uh, reasons why that uh, worth is low. And if he looks at the people he has removed, and I suggest with this man he's found that a lot of it has has had to be family-based problems. Mm-hmm. So he's removed some of these family-based influences that were negative. He'd be best to go back and visit these family places, not visit the people specifically, but go back emotionally and work mm-hmm. through the feelings associated with these family members that are still present within him yep. and allow himself to sensitise, be sent more sensitive to the emotions that are within him regarding these particular matters. If he does that, then what he will find is he will start attracting positive people into his life. At the moment, his soul is still uh, not attracting positive people into his life and that's an indication that there's still things he needs to work through from an emotional perspective. Mm-hmm. So even though he's done the right thing by taking actions, there's still more work to do before it becomes an emotional shift, a true but a soul-based shift in his life. And I feel that's what happens, that's the problem with taking actions a lot of the times, is that we take actions which we know to be right, mm-hmm. but we don't address the emotions associated with it. And unfortunately, that means that very little improvement can actually occur. If we deal with the emotions, there will be large improvements that occur. Yeah. So he'll be surrounded by very loving people once he, and people who want to do the same thing as he, he does once he addresses those particular issues. Yeah. Okay, thank you. When I was first introduced to Divine Truth through, through a friend in Coffs Harbour, my soul was singing and I even did some emotional processing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but now that I'm back home, I avoid feeling emotions and I can't make myself watch another DVD. <laughs> And I'm guessing that the divine love path is very long and challenging. And just want, I just wanted to ask you if you had felt this same way that I do now. <laughs> Maybe you could give me a few ideas for getting back in touch with my emotions. Well, I suppose there's a lot of things I could say here. Um, many people do experience this thing that happens, which is, you become right at the beginning quite enthusiastic about the new external truths that you're hearing. Mm -hmm. And then as you go on, you realise that there's internal things that you're going to have to face. And so you shut down completely and you don't want to do any more and you don't want to watch any more and you don't want to listen any more and you don't want to know any more and you don't want to pray any more and (laughs) you don't want to do anything, right? And, uh, And it's quite clear what's happening, I feel, for a person who's doing this. Firstly, they don't want to come face to face with the personal truth in their lives. So, so the first step is to try to come face to face. Now, she asked me the question, have I ever been through that? No, I haven't. I'm sorry. But the reason why I haven't is because I want to come face to face with the personal truth in my life. I don't feel resistive to divine truth ever. I'm always fascinated by God and God's truths. Mm-hmm. And, and I feel that everybody would be unless they have some major blocks or major fears or major addictions that they don't want to give up. Now, 
for the for the average person who comes into contact with divine truth, we, there is a lot of addictions initially for them, mm-hmm. and. The majority of people are very, very happy to find out about external truth. So they're very happy to find out that God's loving and not not a punishing God and they're very happy to find out, you know, the, the way the universe is constructed and they're very happy to find out there's a spirit world and there's life after death and all are very happy about all of those external, what I would call knowledge-based things about the universe. But when it comes to personal reflection they become very, very unhappy Mm. and they're very resistive. They do not wish to go through anything personally. They don't want to feel anything. They don't want to feel their personal pain and they don't want to progress and connect to their emotions and connect to the emotional pain that's stored within them. And that is usually because there's a lot of anger then there's a lot of addictions that the anger drives, you know, is driven, that drives the anger, sorry. Mm-hmm. And there's a lot of fears that uh, are usually underneath the person being so resistive. Mm-hmm. Now, this lady is very angry about having to make any personal progress. And while we can remain in this kind of anger for long periods of time, the question we've got to ask ourselves is what do we really want? How am I going to use my will? See, if I really want a relationship with God, I won't let such things stop me. If I really want to continue growing for the rest of my existence, I won't let a few emotions, a few a few painful emotions, and when I say a few, it might be 10 years of painful emotions uh, for some people, but it's highly unlikely if they allowed their emotions all the time. Mm-hmm. But But let's say it is 10 years. Surely 10 years of some painful emotions is worth you like thousands of years of joy, like in terms of making that progress. So I feel firstly, a person who's in this state does not have faith in God, does not have faith that they actually can work through emotions. They don't have faith that actually the way is about having to do soul-based work on emotions. (laughs) And they want there to be some other way of getting closer to God. Mm -hmm. And there is no other way. And I think it's wonderful that there's no other way because you can't manufacture it, you can't skip over things. You've got to be really sincere to be on this path. So my suggestion to this lady and others is the question really is, are you sincere about truth? And I'm I'm suggesting to you that if you're resistive to personal truth, then you're not really sincere about truth. Mm -hmm. And, and you can say, then later say to God, oh, well, I didn't know this and I didn't know that. But if you're resistive to personal truth, it, that's the exercise of your will to resist the truth. And, that's, and you can't blame anybody other than yourself for that. Mm-hmm. And you can't blame your parents for that. You can't blame your childhood for that. You can't blame all the painful emotions even inside of you for that. You, that's your personal resistance to truth. And you need to somehow decide to work your way through it. Now, Usually when a person is this resistive, they're usually angry Mm -hmm. that they have to do it. And usually that anger is a lot around things like somebody else put these emotions in me, so somebody else should have to take them out (laughs) type of reasoning. Some, you know, wanting to blame other people for the pain that you feel and all of these kind of feelings are a part of the anger. Now, the anger is an indication that you're in addiction and also that you uh, don't understand love at all, actually. Because any person who gets angry regularly does not understand love at all. So, so my suggestion there is face up to your addictions. Be honest about them. Be truthful about them. Do you even really want to progress? Because if you don't really want to progress, why, why bother even doing it? Mm-hmm. Like there's no, there's no, if there's no internal desire in you to progress on the path, then don't do it. Mm-hmm. But you are going to bear the consequences of such decision. You are you're going to have a a much less happy life in the long term. You are also going to have much more struggle in your life in the short and long terms because you're resistive to God's whole universal structure of love. And if you're honest with yourself, you don't really want to become more loving. So, So you've got to look at why you wouldn't want to become more loving. Now, sometimes that's anger that is driving that. Sometimes it's addictions driving that. And sometimes it's fear driving that. So for for the person who's angry, then there's a lot of usually justifying emotions for their rage. Uh, For the person who's in their addictions, 
they just don't want to get rid of their addictions because if they, they're afraid that if they get rid of their addictions, there'll be nothing left. And that's often the case once you start doing that. So they don't want to get rid of their addictions and they definitely don't want to come face to face with their fears mm -hmm. and have to work their way through them as a child would work through, their way through these emotions. So I feel this is a very important thing that we need to at some point decide that we're going to actually feel these child like emotions that are still locked up within us mm -hmm. and that we actually use our will in a positive manner to become more loving and the only way we're going to become more loving from God's perspective is by removing from ourselves through experiencing these emotions removing the emotions that cause us to be unloving mm -hmm. and and if we're not sincere about that process yes you're going to find the divine truth path or the way very very difficult you in fact almost impossible because God's constructed it such, such, in such a manner. God's constructed it that you have to be sincere. You have to have a true longing for, for God and you have to have a true longing to know the truth about yourself and the truth about the universe. And you can't just know the truth about the universe and ignore all the truths about yourself mm -hmm. because you're living in a universe and everything that happens to you is going to be based around loving laws, trying to correct your unloving ways. And so, of course, it, it, and, and how long it takes is going to be completely dependent upon how willing you are. So if you're very unwilling, it's going to take hundreds and hundreds of years, maybe thousands of years, right? And there's many people that have taken tens of thousands of years. So, so that, that's an exercise of your will. Or it can only take a few years if you exercised your will differently, yeah. but, but it's going to depend a lot upon you. So some of the questions are, I feel, I don't know, demonstrate a lack of faith in God, demonstrate a lack of faith in the way mm -hmm. and, 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 and I'm not saying she has to have faith in God or faith in the way, but, but does she want to have? Yeah. Does, you know, how, what did she want to do with her life? And also she's basically saying that she's guessing the divine love path is very long and challenging. <laughs> and, and I go, well, no, the divine love path is actually forever. It's not, <laughs> it's, it's not, not just long. long, it's going to be the rest of your life <laughs> forever, you know. So, so I suppose that's very, 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 very long <laughs> if, if you look at it that way. But, but it's only challenging when we resist everything. And this is what I find quite strange is that people uh, have all of these challenges on the path and they don't acknowledge that the challenges are a direct result of their own resistance. So can I ask you about challenges then? Because it seems to me that challenges are difficult when we resist them, mm -hmm. but we can have challenges that we embrace and they actually, so the error, for example, is going to be challenged by truth. Oh. But if we're willing part, party to that challenge, then it, it's not such an arduous or difficult thing to face that challenge. Is that correct? No, you, you enjoy every challenge. Yeah. Because you feel like, ah, oh, this is another opportunity to grow. You see, once you've received some of God's love, you're a very positive person. Yeah. You're very optimistic. <laughs> so you're not pessimistic at all. You don't think, oh, isn't this terrible? This is going to last forever, or any of those kind of things. <laughs> you feel completely the opposite of that because you've received some of God's love. You know that it, God's optimistic. God's optimistic that you can go do it. God created your soul to do it. You understand these things. And so you feel very optimistic about every challenge. And so you don't even see them really as a challenge. You just see them as, wow, this is a great opportunity for me to grow and to change. And, and why wouldn't I take the opportunity? It's an opportunity God's given me right in this moment to do that. So yeah. I, I don't even see them really as challenges. I just see them more as events that my soul attracts to demonstrate to me where I'm out of harmony with love and I have the option and of course I desire to always take that option uh, to to actually see the truth of what is really going on to feel about the causal emotions that exist in me that attracted the event mm -hmm. and once I do I know that I'm never going to have to go through that experience again isn't yeah. that wonderful most people in their day-to-day -day life every single day have similar experiences that are negative and they go through them the next day, the next day, the next day, and they have no hope that it's not going to happen again mm -hmm. because they don't know how to stop it from happening. And I feel like the way shows you how to stop it from all happening, yeah. to actually embrace a life that is much more positive, much more enjoyable, 
And, and also you feel much more inner joy because you know you're working your through, way through your fears, you're getting rid of addictions, you know you're becoming a more loving person, that love is demonstrated through your actions to other people and, and also to yourself. You, you become happier as a result, not sadder, happier mm-hmm. as a result. And, and so I feel that th- there are so many positive benefits of following the way for the rest of your existence. Yeah. Why wouldn't you do it? I can't understand why a person would choose not to do it. Yeah. Now, because of her choices to resist her rage and resist her addictions and resist knowing about her fears and feeling them and to, to resist feeling her inner pain, which is the real problem, um, of course she's going to be shut down to emotions. Yeah. And, of course, you're not going to want to watch any DVDs about divine truth. Like, fair enough. Why watch something that's just going to tell you you need to connect to something that you don't want to connect to? Um, my suggestion to her is to, is to look at the reasons why mm-hmm. rather than ignoring the reasons why. Why doesn't she want to? And a lot of times why is all about I'm afraid, I'll lose my family, I'll lose my friends, I'm afraid. And, and when we start listing it all down, we find that there's literally hundreds of reasons why we don't want to do it. Mm-hmm. But, but to me, no matter how many reasons why we don't want to do it, the reasons for doing it are far more powerful and, and, and outweigh any reason that we could have for not doing it. Mm-hmm. And that's what keeps me going. That's what keeps me progressing forward. Yeah. And I suggest to her that's one of the things that she also would need to do. She would need to see the real good reasons for doing it. Yeah. And if she doesn't, then talk about that. Ask questions about that, you know. Sure. So that you can, so that you can gain some faith, so that you feel a lot more comfortable and confident about the, there's a good reason to do it. And I feel the best reason is to have a relationship with the creator of the universe. That's the best reason. The second best reason is I get to have a relationship with the other half of myself and myself that's real, truthful, honest and full of love. Mm -hmm. And then I also get to be a more loving person in all of my interactions with other people. And as a result of that, I also attract more loving interactions with other people. Now, I think that's fantastic. Well, why wouldn't you want to choose those things? And whatever excuses or reasons you've come up with for not doing it, none of them are any as large as those reasons for doing it. Yeah. Yeah. So if I recap a little on what (laughs) you said, um, that's very motivating what you've just been saying. Uh, But it is something that we commonly hear from people, look, I'm just so emotionally shut down and this lady's asking, how can I get back in touch with my emotions? And you've listed quite a few things that obviously this lady is in resistance to. Mm. So you listed um, a resistance to personal truth. Well, let's start even before then. Okay. She has no faith that doing it will actually benefit her in any way. Mm -hmm. That's the first thing. Yep. And then she's got, because she has no faith, she's got a complete resistance to personal truth. Yep. Right? So, so at some stage, faith has to be developed in the process. Right? Yeah. Now, the only way you can really develop faith in a process is to engage the process and see what the outcome is. Once you've engaged the process enough and you see the outcome is consistently good, then you go, why would I not do this? You know? yeah. so, so she needs to build her faith. And, and the only way you can really build your faith is by engaging a process as an experiment and seeing what the outcomes are, truly are, mm-hmm. and then allowing yourself to measure that and, and remember that. So I feel that's where she needs to start. Then once she has enough faith, she'll perhaps want to have a look at all of her resistance to personal truth. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yes, the resistance to personal truth is an issue, but it's probably the second issue. So if we say the first issue is almost a resistance to something you alluded to earlier, external truth, the fact that it's worthwhile and that we can have faith in the process. Yes. Uh, then a resistance to personal truth. Yes. Uh, resistance to seeing addictions. Yes. And anger and fear. Well, a resistance to fear, not just seeing them, but feeling, feeling them. them. Sorry. So feeling her anger, feeling her addictions and feeling her fear and feeling her pain. Mm-hmm. And, and she's worried that her life will change. So she doesn't want to do it. Mm. And don't, if you don't want to do it, don't. Well, but you're going to bear the consequence of not doing it. Yeah. <laughs> I, don't, I don't advise it, but <laughs> what else can you say? 
<laughs> you're allowed to make the choice to not do it. God yeah. says to you, you're allowed to be where you are right now for the rest of your existence if that's what you want. The question I would ask myself if I was her is, do I want that? Do I want to live the current life that I have for the rest of my existence? Because that's what I'm going to do if I don't change. Hmm. And if I, if I don't embrace some kind of change that's real, I'm going to live this life, not only all the way through my life on, on earth, but I'm going to live it also in the spirit world. It's going to be a pretty mundane life for the rest of my existence unless I decide to do something different. Yeah. And my suggestion to her is there's plenty of motivation to do something different. There's plenty of you know, truth to, that would motivate you to do something different. You've just got a question about whether you really believe any of it. Yes. And the only way you can improve your belief is by reading, studying, you know, improving, experimenting. experimenting. Mm -hmm. and, and to do that, you're going to probably have to watch a few DVDs to help you, <laughs> <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> I think it's, it's a, an interesting question in that I know a lot of people who just sort of say, oh, I was feeling emotion, oh, and the emotions ran out, sort of they went away. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I, I'm so amused by that because that's, that's an indication that fear and addiction has just kicked in. <laughs> exactly. And yeah. I suppose that's what I wanted to highlight because I've been one of those people where you just go, oh, it's all gone and dried up. <laughs> and it's easy to sort of throw your hands up and go, oh, that's nothing to do with me. I wonder what it is and, and sort of not really think it's actually because there's something that I want to avoid right now, a fear yeah. or an addiction yeah. um, that... I'm, co I'm purposefully avoiding, which yeah. has caused the emotions to dry up. Because yeah. I know when we first met, I just thought emotions were like, what are emotions? I don't know. <laughs> well, I didn't even like having them. And yeah, well, then I started, I didn't know what they were either. So that's yeah. okay. I feel yeah. everybody gets to that stage. But, but, but to get beyond any of these stages, you've got to develop a desire and that's an exercise of your will. Do you mm -hmm. want to have a desire to yes. get closer to God, closer to love, to become a more loving person, mm -hmm. to receive some of God's love to, so your soul transforms? Do you want that or don't you? Yeah. Now, now, a person who just does a little bit of progress and then stops, my suggestion is your desire isn't that big. It's not that big. Mm -hmm. And so what would you do to develop your desire? You'd have yeah. to work through your fears that you have but you'd also have to look at your will. Yes. Do you really want truth? Do you really want love? Do you, you know, or what do you really feel about those things? Yeah. You're going to have to have a little bit more stronger self-analysis rather than just asking Jesus, what's my problem? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that probably goes for a lot of questions, doesn't it? It does, yeah. <laughs> I, I feel a lot, and this is the thing with these emotion questions, I think we've covered a lot of the basic yeah. issues regarding emotions already, right? And a lot of these individual questions, while they're interesting um, and give us a way to illustrate the problems that mm -hmm. people face, at the end of the day, um, asking somebody else as to what's going on for yourself, while it can help mm -hmm. you work through what's going on for yourself, you've got to first ask yourself, how strong is your personal desire to really do it anyway? To, yeah. to, to really know anyway. You know, I, like honestly, I... Often, I often see that the biggest issue people face is the lack of, the, of, a, of a strong will to, to actually want to love, to want to know truth no matter what. Now, even if I die finding it, like people, there's very, very little of that. People want to have mundane existences because they get to avoid a whole heap of things. And, and they like avoidance. They like their addictions being met. They want comfort. They, you know, basically they want to be nursed by a mummy all mm -hmm. the rest of their life. Mm -hmm. That's what they want. They don't want to grow up and become a self-functioning, self-sufficient adult who has a relationship with God, a relationship with love, a relationship with truth that is, that is unbreakable and, and unable and immovable, unable to be moved by any event or situation or person in their life. And to become that kind of a person, which is the kind of person you will become when you, when you become at one with God, you've got to go through quite a lot of stuff first. You've got to work your way through and be sincere about working your way through a lot of very negative emotions that you've imbibed through your life and also a lot of the, your own bad choices that you made that you need to repent for before you will become that person. And, and my suggestion is it's worth it. And, and like... 
I'm shocked that anybody thinks it's not. <laughs> but I understand that when you begin, um, for a lot of people, they realise that their will isn't very well developed and they have very little faith and they've only ever wanted to have their ears tickled, mm -hmm. as the Bible says, and not really want to have to work through issues. And, and this is a problem that we face on the planet. You know, the, the, we live in a society now, particularly Western society, where everything's about instant gratification. Yeah. So if, it, if, if we do five minutes of spiritual progression, we think, oh, it should be all over now. Mm -hmm. You know, we do 10 minutes of crying, oh, that's finished. You know, and, and to be frank, no, it didn't enter you in 10 minutes. Yeah. It entered you over years and years and years, mm -hmm. generally, of oppression. How, do you, how can you expect that something that's entered you over years and years and years is only going to take 10 minutes, half an hour, days, weeks, or even months? It's going to take you years, to be frank. Yeah. And, and there's nothing you're going to be able to do about that because it's already there and you're just carrying it around anyway. And if you don't do anything about it, you're going to keep carrying around cause keep causing yourself damage, causing other people damage, never having a relationship with God, never being the powerful expression of the person you could be. And, and so, like, why would you want to choose that? Mm -hmm. It makes no sense to choose that from a logical perspective. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I would just encourage this lady to, do, to, to look at those things that we've mentioned. In amongst those things are some of the reasons why she stopped emotional processing. Yeah. And, and honestly... Um, once she works through those feel feelings, she'll probably feel attracted to listening or watching some DVDs or they're not DVDs anymore, they <laughs> videos on YouTube or whatever. And, and she'd also probably be much more attracted to really developing her relationship with God, her relationship with herself, her relationship with her soulmate, developing the love that comes out of her, her wanting to know the truth about her life, not only external things, but wanting to know the truth about her life, yeah. what's happened to her, the feelings that she has, and feeling those feelings because she's going to feel alive when she does. Yeah. So that's what I would recommend to her. Yeah, yeah it really is worth it, hey? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Our next question comes to us from Nikki, mm -hmm. and it's, a little bit lengthy, so bear with me while I read it out. No worries. <laughs> she says, I'm someone who, others tell me, lacks emotional expression. Right. I assume the average person feels and shows their emotion. Now I imagine a simplified emotional spectrum. Can I say firstly that the average person doesn't feel and show their emotion? <laughs> no. And perhaps more than she does. I've met Nikki, so... Um, and I find that many people who have an Asian background, which Nikki does have, have been heavily suppressed emotionally during their childhood. Yeah. And so they do find emotional expression difficult. But don't assume that everybody finds it easy and you find it difficult. The reality is pretty much everyone on the planet finds it difficult to express true emotion. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Well, she's got, um, she's imagining an emotional spectrum. Yeah. So there's her. Yeah. The average person, yeah. <laughs> the very emotional, yeah. and the goal, whatever that is. Whatever that, that is, and that's indeterminate, I gather. <laughs> yeah, she's not quite sure what that is at the moment. Sure. And she gives an example. I know at least one person who is more emotional than the average person. <laughs> she easily and quite frequently cries. Oh, see, this is where it goes off board, doesn't it? But keep yeah. going. I suppose and it's this best is if where we this, read the whole this question is where and the then spectrum, we'll go over it. Um, is not yeah. quite accurate, is it? Yeah, so, that's right. So yeah. let's let's read the whole question and then we'll go back to each point and I'll make comments about each point, sure. I think. Okay. Uh, so she, this is this person that Nikki knows. She easily and quite frequently cries. Mm -hmm. Her husband gives her much to cry about <laughs> because he is not very active in life, compulsively spends what little they have, mm. plus he has a drug addiction. Right. <laughs> Despite her crying for many years, things did not change much. Mm. Well, finally, just this year, he is making an attempt to quit and to change. Mm -hmm. I wonder, shouldn't her life have changed already since she has been feeling her emotions? Or is that it? Am I to be like her or is it not? <laughs> Being someone who lacks emotional expression and observing others who freely show their emotions, I just get confused. Mm -hmm. Because even though they are emotional, that's still not it. No. 
not the goal. Is it because she is, so again, back to her friend, is it because she is still resisting anger and childlike emotions? Is it because she has demands and expectations? Is she somehow addicted to that side of him? Mm -hmm. I think my main question is, what does a 100% emotional being look like? Mm -hmm. What's it like to be in their company and to observe them? Right. Well, let's answer that part of the question first. My suggestion to Nikki is have a look at the recent talks that we did uh, that were done in 2014 called Understanding Your Emotional Self. There's four of them we've done in a series. And the reason why I recommend to you that you have a look at those four particular videos, which will be in the end probably about 12 hours of viewing, sorry about that, (laughs) Um, is because you will start to understand what it's going to look like to be your true emotional self. And so what so those those presentations answer the questions about what it looks like to be your true emotional self. So I don't think we need to say much more on that subject. No. Because you know, the best thing for people to do is to go to those particular mm-hmm. videos, which were seminars done with a small group of people in New South Wales in Australia. Um, and the topic was relationship with God, understanding your emotional self. And there's four sessions. So if we go back to Nikki's story then. Yes, so let's, um, let's look at the story because it, 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 there are comments we need to make about the story. Yeah, and really she's asking a, a kind of a question from someone who's not feeling very much emotion herself. Mm-hmm. She's observing people being emotional and then saying, Is that what I'm, isn't that what I'm supposed to do? And this is the problem when we're not very sensitive to our own emotions, isn't it, that we have problems interpreting Yes. Firstly, we need on. to make comments about why we're not sensitive to our own emotion. And that is because we're in either in complete denial of our own emotion or we're, in, we're terrified of feeling our emotions. Now, most people who are in complete denial or terrified of feeling their emotions have had a very difficult childhood emotionally. What that means is that they were taught at a very, very young age to not feel their emotions. And so it does take a fair bit of time and and self-reflection and self-analysis to be able to start allowing yourself to feel what you really feel. Mm -hmm. And that's going to take, it's like a softening of your soul, I Mm -hmm. suppose you could call that. And that's going to also take looking at the issues of suppression, which is what we discussed with how the human soul functions, looking at the areas of resistance and suppression and also all of the rules, if you like, yep. of how the soul functions. Because you need to understand that you're not going to be able to absorb new things into your soul from an emotional perspective unless some of the old things leave you. Mm. And if one of those old things happens to be your belief about emotions, then, of course, that's one of the first things you're going to have to address. Yeah. So I would recommend firstly for such a person to look much more sincerely at how the soul functions and to rather than seeing it as I'm not an emotional person, you are an emotional person, understanding that every single person has been created to be emotional a being by God. And if we're not, then it's because we're, there is damage that's been done to our soul. And instead of saying I am an emotional, not an emotional person, which is basically saying I am that unemotional being, Mm -hmm. you're really better off saying, I am a person who has been damaged quite a lot and I don't feel my emotions well as a result. So in other words, you start to see not being as an emotional person as damage rather than seeing it as a part of your nature or personality because it's not a part of your true nature and personality. Mm. It's a part of the hurt person that's Mm -hmm. inside of you and not a part of the real person who's inside of you. Mm. Does that make sense? So that's the first thing you yeah. need to come to terms with. Would you like me to read back through the question? So you yeah, can so let's go back go. over yeah. now. So yeah. we've answered that question as to, as to you know, the, the general comments about, you know, saying I am an emotional person and that person's not an emotional person or there's so-called emotional spectrums. Yeah. Yeah, I don't. I don't agree with any of those things because all of us, and I, you know, I've lived in the celestial kingdom, so I know that every single person who's in the celestial spheres is an emotional being, mm. <laughs> and and it's, it doesn't look like her friend crying all the time, by the way. 
So, so we need to define so what it looks like. Can we talk about? Yeah, can we talk well, about? Well, I feel we define that a lot in understanding in the sessions, understanding your emotional self. So, rather than regurgitating all of that information, I think sure. we need to look at her specific situation and make comments about it. All right. Yeah. So, she says one person she knows is more emo emotional than the average person. Mm -hmm. She easily and quite frequently cries. Mm -hmm. Her husband gives her much to cry about mm. because he's just not very active in life, compulsively spends what little they have, plus he has a drug addiction. And it's very interesting here, you see. See, Nikki is seeing it as if her husband is the problem. This, this woman, her friend, her husband is the problem. It's not the problem. The problem is this woman has no self-love at all. Mm. And when she's crying, she's not crying any causal emotion. What she's doing is she's having a tantrum about somebody else, her husband, not loving her and causing her trouble. Mm -hmm. But she doesn't want to leave this man. She doesn't want to have to love herself. So what she's doing in this relationship, this woman, <clears throat> is she's hanging around in a relationship where she doesn't have to love herself, she doesn't want to love herself, and she wants this man to love her. She wants this man to do all of her work for her, basically, mm -hmm. emotionally. Mm -hmm. She wants this man to provide all of her emotional needs. Now, of course, she's attracted to man under these circumstances. You will attract a man who doesn't do that, <laughs> who spends all your money and doesn't make you feel safe and secure financially and who, you know, abuses alcohol or drugs or something else. And, the, and that makes him, you feel like the alcohol or the drugs is the most important thing in his life and not you. Yeah. And, and a lot of other reasons. for and, and then, of course, this person, the woman, starts crying about all of these things. And all of, the, all of her crying is just having a tantrum about the fact she's not getting what she wants. Mm -hmm. Now, that is not processing causal emotion. Yeah. She's not even processing her anger about how she feels. And she certainly doesn't want to love herself. Mm -hmm. If she wanted to love herself, she wouldn't for one moment more put up with that situation. Mm -hmm. She would say to the man, look, I love you, but... I also must love myself in this circumstance or situation and that requires that I leave you for a while while you sort yourself out mm -hmm. and while you get rid of your drug or alcohol or whatever other abusive issue he has towards himself and while you, you take more self-responsibility in your life and I will need to work through all of my addictions as to why I haven't done this 20 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> What, what caused me to stay in this relationship for such a long time or 10 years or however long it is? Yeah. Um, what caused me to stay in this relationship for such a long time while it's abusive towards myself? Yeah. Now, this woman does not want to become more loving. She wants her husband to become more loving yeah. and she doesn't want to have to change herself. She doesn't want her life to change without her husband doing all the work, right? That's not the way it's going to work on the divine truth path. Mm -hmm. it's not the, that's not the way. Mm -hmm. So this woman may be crying, but she is not working through any causal emotion from her childhood. And this is where seeing tears as emotional processing can, that we can really go wrong there, can't we? Totally, yeah. yes, because tears aren't emotional. A lot of people I see when in tears, are really in rages. Mm -hmm. And this woman's in a rage, actually. Mm -hmm. She's using tears. She learnt to use tears in her childhood as an emotionally abusive technique to manipulate somebody into doing what she wants. And it's not working. <laughs> Good. <laughs> it shouldn't work. <laughs> and it's not working. But she then is saying that it's really all her husband's fault. No, she's got a lot of issues to work through about her love of self She's got a lot of growing to do about, you know, how she's not loving herself. She's also not loving her husband because she's putting up with this kind of treatment over and over again. And a person who truly values the truth and values love would not do so. Mm -hmm. So she's not loving her husband and she's not honouring anything. In fact, she's not honouring her children, herself or her husband in this situation. She is teaching her children that they should put up with abusive situations, that they should, uh, you know, put up with abusive, uh, far, you know, uh, like somebody who abuses. I, I don't mean he's abusive to them. Mm -hmm. uh, he may or may not be, but he, he's definitely abusive to himself. 
and and you wouldn't put up with that. Mm. Like if you really love someone, you'd go, no, I don't want you to abuse yourself. You work out why you want to abuse yourself and, but, and I, I'm going to go away from you while you do that or I'll help you to work your way through it if you're willing but I'm not going to put up with this anymore. <laughs> you yeah, know? Yeah. That's what you would do if you love yourself and this woman doesn't want to do that. No. So, so real growth has to be growth in love and truth yeah. and this woman is not growing in love and truth. She is, emo- she is feeling some emotions but none of them are related to her own childhood and her own upbringing which has obviously caused her to accept this kind of treatment from her husband and she she has no desire to address her internal problems and, and as a result she cries about her husband all the time yep and it's interesting that the observer nikki in this case doesn't see that yeah which indicates that nikki herself probably has the same in signs kind of tolerances to abusive behaviour from other people. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, so, so that that's an important point that you just made, that often when we have a similar injury, we find it difficult to see in what's really the, going the on. error in it yeah. when it's in another. Right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And the error in this lady that Nikki's describing is the fact that she doesn't want to love herself. Mm-hmm. She doesn't want to. Mm-hmm. Right. And lots of people don't want to love themselves for all sorts of reasons. Some people believe that if they love themselves, then it lets everybody else off the hook, <laughs> which it does, actually. Yeah. That's what love does, it lets everybody off the hook. <laughs> but, but they don't like that idea. You know, they get angry about that idea, so they don't want to do that. Or they feel like people should love them. They yeah. demand love or, or so forth. Now, of course, love demanded isn't love anyway. Mm-hmm. Love is always a gift. So, you know, there's a misunderstanding about love in that. So there's a lot of misunderstandings in lo- about love that would cause a person to cry about their husband's abusive behaviour. So I don't know quite how to put this into words, So, sure. and I, even into a question, <laughs> yeah. but I'll do my best. What I have noticed is that whenever there is a release of causal emotion, mm-hmm. so tears, mm-hmm. and if we use, because uh, Nick is talking about tears, Whenever, and usually causal emotion is released via tears. Well, not necessarily, say? no. If it's it fear, can, then it might if not If it's be. fear, you'll be shaking, yeah. Yeah. terrified perhaps. If it's shame, you'll be hot flushes and mm-hmm. allowing yourself to feel that. You know, it just depends on the emotion sure. as to what it is. Yeah. Okay, but usually because you were talking about the misunderstandings of love that this lady has. Mm-hmm. Which all were created in her childhood. Yep. So she needs to go back to her inner child, if you could use that expression. Or you could say, and more correctly say, she needs to go back into her damaged child, yes. which is the hurt child that's within the, the second of the three selves. Mm-hmm. Remember the three selves, there's the, the real self, the hurt self, the facade self. Yep. This woman's in her facade self. She's not, and all of the processing she's doing in that place doesn't mean a single thing. Uh, she can go on like doing that for the next 50 years. Can we even call it processing? No, it's not processing yeah. because processing is all about feeling the hurt self. So, yeah. yeah and this or is... feeling the reasons why you constructed your facade self. Okay. Yeah. Which are all based on the hurt. Yeah. Go on. But you no, no um, my observation is that there's always truth in that in causal processing always but it's also always childhood yeah or repentance it's only those two things yeah in this case the lady needs to repent for the way she's treating herself Mm. Mm. and she obviously is treating herself this way because of something that occurred in her childhood that made her have a predisposition towards treating herself this way yeah so there's always an element of truth of what happened in our childhood or truth in the way that we've harmed another when we are releasing a cause of Always, yep. So this lady is not connected with truth on either level. No, no truth about love at all, no truth about herself, no truth about her husband. He doesn't care. He, he loves drink more than, or drugs more than he loves her. Mm-hmm. So there's no truth about that. You know? And she's not uh, also being truthful about the way that she's attempting to manipulate him? Through... That's right. She's yeah. emotionally manipulating him. Yeah. She's doing, using a technique that many women use mm-hmm. because they, when they get angry with, an, with a man who's abusing substances, the man gets angry in return and probably becomes physically violent. 
So they don't want that. So what they do is they use tears as a way of emotionally manipulating the man to change his behaviour. Yeah. But that's a learned response from her own childhood, mm -hmm. you know, but it, but it is manipulative and it's out of harmony with love. It's where she's not being loving to him. Yeah. You don't manipulate a person when you want their behaviour to change. You just say, I need your behaviour to change because it's this and that and this and that, which is all unloving. And if you don't do that, uh, well, I, I, I'm just saying, I'm going to leave you until you do that. Yeah. You wouldn't even say if you do that yeah. or don't do that. You just go, I'm going to leave you until you do that. Yeah. And and when you when you're ready, when you think you've done that, give me a call because I I still love you. Yeah. 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 <laughs> you know, I still yeah. care about you. I still love you. I still want to be with you. I just can't put up with that behaviour. Yeah. Okay. So then, if we go back to Nikki's start of the question, where she's imagining a spectrum, mm -hmm. where she's on one end. The average so person... So I suppose she saying, like, shut down, shut down. Totally shut down, she's <laughs> yeah, <okay>. saying. The <laughs> average person, yeah. the very emotional and the goal, mm -hmm. and she's saying her friend is in this very emotional category. Yeah, I don't feel so. Which is further along the spectrum than Nikki. But yeah. can, is that really a fair statement? No, no, not at all. Her friend is in her addictions and using manipulative techniques in her passive aggressive rage mm -hmm. to manipulate the situation or attempt to and she's not going to have much success doing it to be frank because that's what her soul's needing to learn she needs to learn that anytime you attempt to manipulate a person using emotional techniques it's not loving and she yeah. needs to learn that so mm -hmm. so yeah so highly unlikely so she, she she is in just as shut down or even more shut down place than Nikki yourself is. Mm. Which is very interesting, isn't it? Yeah. It seems to me that the spectrum is not a spectrum of emotionality. It's about a spectrum of love and truth and our of emotions course. do grow as we progress along that spectrum. Well, our, our emotions emotional... become real. Yes. Yeah. See, this woman's emotions are all facade. So that's not real. None of that's real. And it's only when you start feeling the hurt child yep. or where you've caused hurt to others, the two sides of things. The hurt child is all about forgiving others and feeling what you've done to others is all about repentance. Mm -hmm. And it's only when you start feeling those two groups of emotions that you actually make any soul-based progress. And once you do that, you will start seeing glimpses and eventually whole parts of your inner self, the self that God created, the real true self that God created. But this woman is in her facade completely. She's completely shut down to all of her mm -hmm. true self. Mm -hmm. and, and, as, and I'm saying this woman, the woman she's describing, that yeah. Nikki's describing, her friend is shut down completely. Now, Nikki herself is shut down too. Mm -hmm. She's in denial, but she's not using as many emotionally manipulative techniques yep. because she probably wasn't taught to do that in her childhood. Yep. She's using denial as a tool mm -hmm. and fear as a tool to shut herself down. And yep. That's a different, uh, different techniques. So I would suggest, you know, again, we need to get out of the facade-based self and into what's really going on inside of the child uh, in terms of what happened in the child's life mm. if we're ever going to make any true progression in our soul. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I think that we've answered Nikki's question. I think so. There's a lot um, of she elements. says a lot of things down. If you look in the third paragraph, perhaps... Yeah, she says, being someone who lacks emotional expression and observing others who freely show their emotions, I just get confused. Well, well, the woman she's using an example, if that's an example of a person who's freely showing their emotions, and I, I can't agree, that's in a person who's freely demonstrating their facade mm -hmm. and using emotional manipula emotionally manipulative techniques to control others. Now, that, that's not what I'm recommending to people. No. In fact, that's a long way away from what I'm recommending to people. So, so I wouldn't say, I, I've, I feel that such a person who does those things lacks just as much emotional expression as someone who's completely in denial of their emotions or completely shut down like Nikki is. So, yeah. so I feel that they're equal, you know, like that, that there's not some, someone that's better than others. And this is why Nikki's getting confused. Yeah. She's getting confused because she's, she's judging something by observation, looking at a person, but then she's seeing the person's life not changing. Now, what that indicates is that if a person's life isn't changing, then it means nothing is happening. Yeah. Nothing, no soul-based change is actually going on. Yeah. So let's be honest. What Nikki needs to do is be honest about these people that she sees being emotional and go, has their life changed? No. If their life hasn't changed, then they're not 
expressing emotions from their true self or yeah. from their hurt self. They're only expressing emotions from their facade self, which is all about anger, rage, passive aggression, you know, using emotion as a manipulative tool to change other people and so forth. None of that will cause any change. And in fact, it will cause a darkening of your soul if you mm -hmm. keep doing those kind of things. Mm -hmm. right? And I can understand why Nikki might be confused if she's thinking that that is the way to progress because it certainly is not. Yep. Yep. And then she says... Because even though they are emotional, it is still not it. Now, see, so so there's a feeling knows, in her. Yeah. There's a feeling in her that she doesn't really trust at this point. That no, that can't be it. And the reason why this feeling exists is because she's going. Oh, but her life's not changing. So something's wrong. And she's right. Something is wrong. <laughs> when a person's life is not changing, it means they're not actually doing the work. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's quite obvious they're not doing the work, and quite obvious their soul isn't changing. When your soul changes, your life changes. And in fact, you can, your life will change quite rapidly. The instant your soul changes, usually within a few minutes, your life starts changing. That's how rapidly, rapidly it occurs. Mm -hmm. And that, that applies to your body, your health, your life, your, your relationships, and everything about your life changes as soon as you actually address something causal. So, so if nothing of that, none of that is occurring, then it means no real changes are occurring. And the person who's doing all this so-called emotional processing is actually just having a tantrum and, and having manipulation, using emotion as a manipulative tool to remain in their facade self. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's what they're doing. So she says, is it because she is still resisting anger and childlike emotions? Yes, she is not only resisting anger, childlike emotions, she's also resisting the fact that she is not loving herself. She is being manipulative emotionally to others, which means she is not loving others mm -hmm. and obviously has little desire to become more loving with others. So she's resisting quite a lot of things, actually. And she says, is it because she has demands and expectations? Yes. Demands and expectations all come from your addictions mm -hmm. and this woman is in total addiction with her environment that's why she remains in an abusive relationship and and she's in total addiction to remaining in that relationship because it gives her what she needs mm -hmm. and sometimes what we need is to feel superior to another person or, or feel better than somebody else and yeah. something and and these are all things that she needs to and analyze this woman Nikki's friend yeah. needs to analyze uh, if she's ever going to want to progress emotionally right yeah she is somehow addicted to that side of him. Yes, she is totally addicted to the man she ended up with yeah. and that's why she stays with him. Yeah. She's totally addicted for a lot of reasons and she yeah. needs to examine the reasons. Now, all of that means that she's in her addictions and every time she cries, it's because she, her addictions are not getting met yeah. and that's anger. Yeah. That's not sadness. Mm -hmm. That's anger. That's an expression of rage, passive-aggressive, but rage nevertheless, to, uh, to her environment that somebody else needs to come and fix this man or she needs to fix it in order for her life to improve. Mm -hmm. No, the only person you need to fix in order for your life to improve is you. And automatically once you do that, your life will improve. Yeah. And, and that means that the people who uh, don't come along for the ride will leave your life, but they'll do it voluntarily because they want to. And the people who feel like, you know, want to join you in your progress, will come into your life and they'll do that voluntarily, not because you forced them and not because you have an addiction with them and not because you demanded something else of them. Mm -hmm. So that's, you know, part of what being emotional looks like. Now, we've already answered her main question, yeah. I feel, but, yeah. but I feel it's an inter it was an interesting question because... It's a good question. Because yeah. it, it demonstrates, I feel, what happens to a lot of people. A lot of people... Uh, look at emotion, they go, oh, that's feeling really, really off, you know, I don't, you know, yes. and then they go, is that what AJ's talking about? Oh, well, no, I'm not talking <laughs> about that. <laughs> Definitely not. I'm talking about something that's a sincere, honest process emotionally that's about connecting to either the hurt child that's in you or the person that, the, the damage you've done to yourself Yep. through harming others yep. and you need to connect to both if you're ever going to become at one with God. And eventually, once you do that, you'll release some real emotion and your life will instantly change yep. and then you'll go, wow, this is what it feels like. It's actually quite good. <laughs> it's actually quite good because I, I start to understand and have faith that if I really change my soul, 
then I've got the capacity to change everything in my life. Mm -hmm. And everything in my life will change once I change my soul. And once you understand those particular things from it and have faith in that, wow, you know, you can make some very good progress on the path uh, because you've come to terms with some very basic truths about the path itself. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But the process you're describing is sounds very personal. Yes. Uh, so it's not necessarily, we're not necessarily spewing our emotions out onto other people. Yeah. We're, we're in introspective and reflecting and asking for God's truth on things and yeah. we're experiencing emotions in that process. Correct. But it's not necessarily just whatever emotion we feel is releasing something. No, yeah. because most a lot of the emotions we feel come from unloving sources within us and they are all about our demands and our addictions not being met and as a result they are unloving emotions they are emotions that we perhaps still need to feel so that we recognize them and go wow i you know i really feel like crying now that that now that my husband spent all my money mm-hmm. why is that mm. why did i even give him the ability to spend all my money yeah. you know you know you start to question those particular things and that's important because you do need to question those things in order to become more loving of yourself and more loving of your husband under those circumstances so so yes you need to question all those things but it's going to be a very sincere, honest process and not a process that is just like that never-ending crying about the same situation for years and years and years with no change occurring. Mm-hmm. That, that's a passive-aggressive rage in an attempt to manipulate the environment through your, your crying and that, that's not very nice at all and actually it's actually going to cause a degradation of your own condition and therefore more pain for you and everyone around you in the longer term. Yeah. And that's not what we're talking about when we're talking about connecting with yourself emotionally. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah. Our next question comes to us from Catherine. Yep. She asks, there are so many different levels of fear, anxiety, agitation, up to full-blown terror. Mm-hmm. I find myself in one of these emotions frequently. Mm-hmm. I feel I'm connecting to some of the emotions causing the fear, but my fear is being ramped up. Is this normal or am I not feeling the cause? Mm. Well, g'day, Catherine. (laughs) Good to see you again. Yes, uh, this is something that we need to be conscious of, is that usually when we begin emotionally processing any causally based emotion, so childhood emotion, Mm We, we, re, we go through a soul series of stages or steps. Now, I've written about them many years ago and probably what we'll do at some point is probably have a Q&A about those steps. I'd really because like we, we've Because we realise it's something that a lot of people have never read and therefore um, probably don't really understand. But, but let's go through some general parts of the steps. Firstly, you go through an intellectual awareness or you start with no intellectual awareness and no soul-based awareness. Yeah. Usually that's where you start. In other words, you're in complete denial, both intellectually and emotionally. And then, of course, uh, the first step generally is we become intellectually more aware. So in other words, we go, well, you know, I must have some emotion because my mum and dad treated me this way and my school people treated me this way and the teachers treated me that way and, you know, through my life. this. So I must have some emotion that I have to feel but I just can't feel it. So this is what I would classify as an intellectual awareness developing, but still not much emotional or no emotional awareness. Then as we go down, and I won't, I won't illustrate in this discussion all the different steps down into mm-hmm. complete to, to a soul-based awareness, but as we go through the intellectual awareness stages, and there's four or five of those, we get to the point where we start becoming emotionally aware. Yeah. And this is what's happened to Catherine with regard to her fear. So so before it was just all a sort of theoretical discussion. Now she's starting to feel some of her fear. So she's gone from being completely emotionally unaware of her fear, in other words, suppressing this fear, dramatically suppressing it inside of her soul, resisting it completely, which is all about the principles of resistance and suppression Mm -hmm. in how the human soul functions. And, of course, while she's been resisting and suppressing those things, she has not been very sensitive to other feelings either, because once you shut down one emotion, you also shut down others. 
So she's been in this state for a lot of her life, yeah. shutting down whole groups of emotions. Now, now that she started to allow herself to get into a, a state of emotional awareness, she's starting to feel some of these feelings that she's processing. Now, there's seven or eight steps of emotional awareness too. Some of them we go through instantly and other ones take many months to achieve, mm -hmm. depending on the levels of emotional resistance that we have to the experience of an emotion. And this is why I say we probably need to have a discussion about that subject yes. at some point. But for Catherine, she started to go down into these areas of soul-based processing through some of the emotion. Now, when you get into this phase of your processing of emotion, the real emotion, the hurt child's emotion in this case, because all of our fears generally are related to the hurt child's emotion, mm -hmm. what happens is that you start, it, there is an intensifying of the emotional experience. That's because you're now in allowance. Your, your allowance of your emotion is improving and therefore the emotional experience which you have been up till now suppressing, ha is now improving. So in other words, you're now becoming more sensitive to the motion, emotions that are inside of you. And of course, if the emotion is fear, then that means that you'll become more sensitive to the feeling of intensifying fear. Mm -hmm. You'll start feeling it bodily, you'll shake a lot. Uh, stuff before that you weren't even doing at all, you now are, are exhibiting through your body, you're releasing this, if you're truly releasing, you're releasing this causally based emotion. Now, during that phase, it does sometimes feel like it's intense, it's intensifying. Mm -hmm. The reality though is this level of fear has always been in you, but you've just not allowed yourself to experience it and you've used techniques, mm -hmm. sometimes a lot of techniques, in order to suppress it. And some of these techniques include physical techniques, mm -hmm. such as using, um, you know, your movement and your way you get, you know, moving out of the way of emotion, busying yourself, working hard. I know working hard's been a very big thing for Catherine. Mm -hmm. So she's been used physical ways of avoiding the emotion. She's also used emotional ways of avoiding the emotion. In other words, substituting emotion for other emotion, mm -hmm. blaming herself when mm -hmm. she shouldn't be blaming herself and things like that. She's used emotional techniques. She's, uh, she's sometimes resorted to substances like food, mm -hmm. for example, to avoid the emotion. And most people have a long list of ways that they've used to suppress and deny emotion. And then as they've deconstructed that, which I know Catherine has done over the last few years, you, you start becoming more sensitive to what's really there. And for, for a lot of people, it is a shock what's actually there, the, the depth of the intensity of the emotion that's present. But the emotion isn't actually intensifying in the sense that, in the sense that it's, um, in the sense that that emotion has always been there inside of you. It's just that now you're allowing the experience of it. And remember, emotion, mo like energy becomes emotion once you experience it. So, so this emotion is now being allowed to be experienced. Yeah. And of course, it has a feeling of intensifying. Yeah. And this is a phase that everyone will need to go through with regard to every type of emotion. Yeah. Not just with fear. Sometimes it feels to me like a tense a tensed muscle yes. and it, it goes numb and you're, even... you're holding 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 you don't yes. you lose awareness really of that and you then... can't even feel it yeah even. you get to a point where you can't even feel the physical pain of it even though your body is obviously in physical pain because once you start to release it well that's what I was going to say as I seem to soften up more my yeah. soul suddenly there's more pain everywhere everywhere and it's, it's like there's a, a muscle that's been tense that I've been holding on with my resistance to keep these emotions yes. shut down and not moving. Yes. And as soon as I soften and they begin to move, the pain seems to intensify yes. massively. And yes. it was always there. It was just that my will has changed where Correct. I was once holding it down. Now it's moving and that gives me more sensitivity to it. Of course. Yeah. Of course. And this is what people need to get used to. You see, what happens generally, though, is people are not used to this. What, no. what they do is they start allowing the sensitivity to their emotion. Then they start finding the emotion gets fairly powerful mm -hmm. because for the first time they've actually allowed its true experience because yeah. it was powerful as a child, like extremely powerful as a child, but you were often powerfully suppressed as well. 
And uh, of course, we've learnt and purposefully learnt, many of us, techniques to suppress so mm -hmm. that we don't have to bear that kind of pain. And so what we do is we've, because we've learnt all of these techniques, uh, we've powerfully suppressed these powerful emotions. So once you take away all of the suppression and take away all of the resistance, the emotion starts to flow. Mm -hmm. And as a result, it starts to flow and, in, and it feels like it's intensifying. And it's a phase that we need to go through until we're at the stage where we're truly feeling the real experience, which will be very intense, yep. actually. Very intense experiences are what cause us to heal. We allow the experience of the locked up intense experience, then we will have some healing effect from processing the emotion. And this is a process that we go through. It's, it's the opposite process to how the emotion was suppressed. Mm -hmm. If you think about it, we initially had the emotion, then the heavy suppression instantly, and all sorts of techniques and everything piled a whole heap of stuff on top of this emotion. And what we've done up is start to pull it all apart, pull it all apart, wash it all down, if you like, yeah. until we get down to the real problem. And the problem is going to be a very smelly <laughs> <laughs> problem because it's been festering in our soul for years and years and years yeah. and it's going to be quite intense to go through it yeah. and you need to learn how to process through intense emotions. You need to learn how to do that safely and you need to learn how to do that, you know, relying on God and you need to learn how to do it for your own sake mm -hmm. and so that you don't have to rely on anybody else to do it. You need to learn how to do it without damaging yourself. You need to learn how to do it without damaging other people. Mm. And this is all a part of your learning process, actually, mm -hmm. in terms of how you become your true emotional self. Is it a part of understanding our soul, really? Yeah, and it the is. will of our soul and yeah. the, the nature of our soul. And also that we don't have to fear emotion. Yes. You see, most people have tremendous amounts of fear of emotion itself. And fear is what causes most of our pain. Yeah. If you're not afraid of your emotion, it's very rare that a lot of pain will occur. You'll have emotional pain, of course, but you won't have as much anywhere near as much or any physical pain once yeah. you're feeling your true it, causally based emotions, the hurt child emotions. Mm. So, so, you know, I feel she's going through a natural process, which she's begun. Yeah. And I know Catherine and I know that she's also now accepting more truth. She's finding more truth about her personal life is coming to her. Mm -hmm. She's found more and more out about the, her, her, the role her father and her mother paid, uh, played in her abuse. And, and as a result, you know, there's going to be a lot of fear to feel, unfortunately. And the key is to rely on God and trust the soul's process. Mm. Just let let that trust that soul, the soul of yours that God created. Trust that God created it to cope with anything, and allow yourself to go through the experience. Your fear of the experience is going to cause pain. So what happens for Catherine is every time she gets afraid of the deepening emotional experience, she often then tries to run away from the emotional experience, and that's what causes some physical pain and also causes some spirits to in to overcloak her in that moment and affect parts of her organs of her body and so forth. And, and that could all be avoided as long as she just allowed the process for Okay, because I was a, I'd like to ask you about something else I've observed. So in this case, we know Catherine. We yeah. know she has a fairly sincere will yes. to look at herself yes. and to deal with her fear. Yeah. But I have observed in other people, especially when it comes to the to the emotional release of fear, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. begin to touch into their fear. Yep. Their soul-based desire is not to experience fear, and not to experience the truth about fear. Yep. And so they then attract a lot of spirits who begin who are in a fearful state. Mm -hmm. The person doesn't want to be there themselves. They absent themselves and a lot of spirits get involved in it can feel like a ramping up of fear for that person. Yeah, but it's it's not really, is it? It's, it's, no. it's a projection from these spirits uh, towards them of their own fear. Yes. And, and the reality is when we try to avoid our own fear, we will receive these projections. And, there's, and in fact, there are many, many spirits in the spirit world who have a complete desire for every person on earth to deny every fear and they have a complete desire to help you deny every fear yeah. as well. 
And that's a whole different discussion about spirit influence, really, and sure. how it occurs. Okay. Yeah. So in that case, we wouldn't see any relief. No. There'd be no relief. It There'd be, be no growing truth. Yes. There would be no growing awareness of the situation of what the cause is. There'd be no connection to the childhood experience, the mm -hmm. fear-based childhood experience. Catherine's had many fear-based childhood experiences that have been suppressed. And, and that she's now that she's now up allowing to herself to open up yep. to and remember yep. Yep. and experiencing, and this is a good indication that she's actually doing some true emotional work. Yep. Whereas the, a person who's just getting over by spirits isn't doing those kind of things generally. They, instead, they have their they really because they don't want to face their own fear. They're now experiencing the fear of other people. And of course, if you don't want to feel your own fear, you will attract many people around you, both on earth and in the spirit world, who tell you, don't do it, don't do it, it's dangerous. Yeah. Yeah. You know, there are so many uh, therapists have been told, you know, just be very, very careful how you, yeah. you know, work through issues with a person on, a, you know, with regard to helping them because yeah, it can be very dangerous. And it can be very dangerous, but only when a person is in desire to avoid. Yeah. And of course, most people who go to therapists have have usually a feeling that they want the therapist to solve their problem, mm -hmm. and they and they also generally have a feeling, as most therapists know, that they wish to avoid their own emotional experience, and yeah. and this is what causes the danger. Mm -hmm. If you truly absorb and allow your own emotional experience, you will never be any in any danger. Yeah. Great, thank you. Is it my fault that I was abused? Well, no, of course not. It, but I have to clarify some things here with this question. Firstly, as a child, it's never your fault that you're abused, ever, mm -hmm. under any circumstances, no matter what the abuse occurred and no matter what the adults around you who abused you told you. Mm -hmm. And even if the person who abused you was a child, it's still not your fault. Abuse occurs because somebody chose to be unloving to you. Somebody else, other than you, chose mm -hmm. to be unloving to you. That's why abuse occurs as a child. Now, where I need to clarify is what happens as an adult. Yep. Now, if as an adult we are getting abused or we feel we are being abused, then yes, there are some things that we need to look at mm -hmm. with regard to our own inside of ourselves that may be causing or attracting such abuse. And when I say causing or attracting such abuse, what I mean is that there are issues within us about love that we don't understand, where we are not being loving to ourselves at the soul level, that is causing other people to believe that they can get away with abusing us. Yeah. See, as an adult, unfortunately, because abuse occurs generally as a child, quite frequently, in fact, as mm -hmm. a child, most of these children grow up to be adults who are still really children. Yes. And the problem with that is that they still act like a, an abused child. Yeah. So because they act like an abused child, they don't believe that they have any power to prevent abuse. Mm -hmm. And because they don't believe they have power to prevent abuse and they haven't worked through the issues of self-love surrounding abuse, they often attract abuse as a result of their unwillingness to go through those groups of emotions. Now, that's not their fault still. The, the fault of the abuse is always in the abuser. Mm -hmm. But we must see that if we are refusing to address childhood abusive issues, there is a high likelihood as an adult we will still attract abusive adults. Yeah. And the reason for that is, is that we are really still like an abused child that hasn't felt its feelings about it. And so the adults who see us don't see us as an adult who has self-awareness, the ability to prevent abuse and attack, they see us as an, a child still because emotionally we still are. Mm -hmm. So they feel us as a child still ready to accept abuse. And this is why a lot of adult people who have had abusive childhoods still get abused during their adult life because the thing coming out of their soul is that I'm still a child who's been abused, right? Yeah. And, and so every adult around them who's sensitive to that goes, okay, I have an opportunity here. This is their, these are the, the damaged and very unloving people who believe that they are able to take these opportunities and they are very evil in terms of their nature because they're willing to hurt other people. But 
they, they can scan whole groups of people and go, that woman over there, even though she's 30, was abused as a child, and I know I can get away with abusing her again. Mm. And I know that if I abuse her, she will probably blame herself, mm. right? And because she is oftentimes blaming herself from her childhood, and, and this is the part of the problem. She needs to go through the emotions where she felt like it was her fault, where she was told it was her fault and so forth, and come out the other side of that and she'll realise none of it was her fault, yeah. none of it. So, so while I'm making the comment initially that no, no abuse is your fault ever, even if you're an adult or a child and you're being abused by other people, none of it is your fault. There is this qualifying thing that we need to state, and that is that as an adult, if we're still getting abused, then we've got to examine the reason why, because it is partly to do with what we've not let go of. Yeah. Because the people around us believe that they can abuse us still, even though we're an adult. See, as a child, they could get away with it. When mm -hmm. many of the abusers know that it's quite easy to abuse a child, a child's not big, a child doesn't have the, uh, you know, much of a will to fight, you can manipulate and frighten a child quite easily. You can make a child believe things, uh, particularly when it's in the early ages, under seven years of age. You can make a child believe things that, that later it would never accept as truth. And, and the problem with, for that child who has been abused is that child grows to be an adult with all the distorted viewpoints of the child. Yeah. Because all of the emotions are still locked up inside of the child. Mm -hmm. and, and unless the adult survivor of abuse actually allows themselves to go through the emotions associated with abuse, they will still act like a, a child survivor of abuse Yeah, because the, the emotions are locking them up at the age. And this is a principle relating to the soul and how it functions. Mm -hmm. Every time you have a suppressed emotion, this suppressed emotion that's not allowed its full experience is locked up at the age that it was suppressed. Yeah. So if that age happens to be three, you will act like you're three when you're in the same situation. If the age was five, you will act like you're five when you're in the same situation. And unless you release the emotion, you will continue to do that. Mm -hmm. And it will be a great struggle for you otherwise to, to try to fight that process. Now, so there's, there's some very important things that we've said here, I think, and I just need to go over them. One, no, never is the abuse your fault. If you are being abused by someone else, it is never your fault. Whether you're an adult, whether you're an or, adult a child. or a child. Yeah. It is the fault of the person who's choosing to abuse you mm -hmm. and is a choice that they are making for whatever reasons, we, and we probably can go into those reasons at another time, but they're making a choice to avoid all their own painful reasons and, and all, or, all of their unloving behaviour and all of their, you know, evil actions. Yeah. And they are choosing to abuse you. And so it's not your fault ever. However, if we are getting abused as an adult, as an adult then we need to look at the fact that we still really think of ourselves as a child. Mm -hmm. And that means that we have quite a lot of childlike emotions locked up within us that we are refusing to feel and release. And so it would benefit us immensely if we went through either with the aid of a therapist or a helper or even by ourselves with God and we, if we went through these emotions, these childlike emotions, and then come out the other side of them. And the reason you're making the distinction between the adult and the child in that situation is that the, ch the adult now has the free will choice to actually experience more of that emotion than they perhaps did when they were a child and abused. Yes, um, they definitely have, well, they have a lot more than that, yep. actually, not just the exercise of their free will. And uh, I suppose we need to qualify it in today's society. Um, in, in the Western world, every single adult is protected by law, generally. Yeah. Right. So we do have the opportunity to resist abuse mm -hmm. by law. Yeah. Right. Unfortunately, in other countries, some third world countries and, and less developed countries from a from a love perspective, yeah. that's not always the option. So, for example, if you're a woman living in the Middle East, um, abuse at the hands of men is almost sometimes a, a bit of a way of life. Yeah. You accept certain forms of abuse and the law does not protect you. Mm -hmm. 
Now, under those circumstances, um, there's little you can do aside from feeling about every event. Yep. Does that make sense? Uh, and, and releasing every event that occurs. Now, if you release every event that occurred during your childhood, there'd be a far less likely that these events would then occur as an adult. Yep. Um, however, if you don't release the events that occurred during your childhood, it's far more likely the events will continue as an adult because the adults around you will see you as a child that they can still abuse. Mm -hmm. Even though you're in an adult body, they will still feel you as a child who can still be abused. Mm -hmm. Now, in the Western world, and most like, so we're talking now Europe, the Americas generally, you know, Australia here. Um, and other countries that are a bit more developed have laws protecting every person, yeah. children and adults, uh, against abuse. Now, under those circumstances, if abuse is still occurring to you and you're an adult, it is because of this primary thing that you need to address inside of yourself, that you are allowing abuse to occur. Yeah. yeah. And, and there is a reason why you do that, and that is because you still think of yourself as a child who's been abused. So you're saying the reason you're allowing it is that you have suppressed childhood experience? Correct. And how do you begin to disallow it? By feeling and releasing the childhood experience. Yeah. So you have to go through the emotions that you're resisting that that were part of the childhood abusive experience. Mm -hmm. That's the mm -hmm. only way you can protect yourself really. Yeah. So so this is why many people for example, we often see many people who have been sexually abused as a child get raped as an adult. Mm -hmm. And the reason why this occurs is because there is an openness inside of the soul of that person through the abuse of the child, which has never been patched up, never been repaired through their experiencing of the emotions associated with it. And usually parents or other people around them don't allow them to experience those emotions. So they've, they've mm -hmm. you know, during their childhood, they've got good reason to not experience mm -hmm. a lot of these emotions. But now as an old adult, they've chosen to continue to suppress these emotions and unfortunately, that's going to attract abusive men who then think that they can get away with abusing the adult woman yep. or raping her, in other words. And, and it's not her fault that she's being raped because it's the abusive man's fault that she's raped. But there is this feeling they feel from her which they, that they can get away with it. And that's something that she can patch up within herself. Yeah. Yeah. And so that feeling will then alter the the feeling of those childhood events will alter the feeling coming from that person's soul. Yeah. But no doubt would also cause her to start to make some different decisions. Yes. Yep. Yes. Yep. So as she released some of these childhood feelings, she would start to feel like she has power, that she has uh, self-responsibility, she, she's not going to enter sexually dangerous situations anymore. See, children that have had sexual abuse, for example, often as adults enter sexually dangerous situations, which, yeah. which then make them more su sub subject to further abuse. Mm -hmm. uh, where once she's healed those particular childhood experiences, she wouldn't be attracted to those same situations anymore. Yeah. She wouldn't be drawn to pandering, to fear, to, to to people who are angry anymore. She wouldn't, you know, place herself in situations that could be potentially dangerous to her person or, sex or, or sexually or physically. Mm -hmm. And as a result, she would be far more protected uh, as a result of those particular things. On top of that, because she doesn't have the underlying emotional reason inside of her, uh, her spirit guides and spirit friends can also help assist her protection now more rather than she just going along with the normal adult way of things. So, so for example, if a child who, a, ch a person has been abused in their childhood and then they have friends in their adult life that say, let's go along to party and the, and the child, the hurt child is going, oh, I think this is a pretty dangerous party. You know, there's, that, there's people who are abusive here. If, if she stays the child, she'll stay there. Yeah. Uh, but if she's an adult now, she would go, oh, okay, no, I, I'm noticing this is a dangerous place and I need to walk out of here and just get going. And, yeah. and it doesn't matter to her whether her friends stay or not. She, she would leave, right? So this is where we make changes and, and as a result we're far more protected. Yeah. Right? yeah. So, so we can't assume that if we have been harmed, abused as an adult, that, that, that there isn't something that we need to work on personally because there is. Firstly, we need to release the feelings associated with the abuse that occurred as an adult, but we also need to feel about the childhood experience that, that obviously caused the adult who's, who's attacking me to potentially believe that they can get away with that attack. Mm -hmm. 
Now, of course, you can be completely at one with God and still get abused. Mm. However, your response to the abuse will be completely different. All right, so you will no longer be saddened by it or, or you, you won't feel a huge Private. amount of pain about it. Uh, you won't feel like fighting it. You won't feel like, you know, there's a, and you won't feel bad about yourself yeah. as a result of it because you'll, you'll be able to appropriate the, the, the responsibility for the abuse upon the person who chose the act. Yeah. Um, so so there's not a, you can't say that a person who's not at one with God will never be, a person who's at one with God won't be abused. Mm -hmm. But you can say that they will, they will greatly lessen their chances of being abused uh, because there's no longer any emotions in them that relate to the inner child that's hurt. Yes. And so, so the people around them will no longer believe they could get away with it mm -hmm. as easily as they maybe would do otherwise. Yeah. So there's a lot of things to work through. There's a lot we could talk about abuse. And, and to be yes. honest, I think when it comes to uh, our discussions, F FAQs about sexual matters, one of the sexual matters we'll, we will be discussing as a part of that series of FAQs is the subject of sexual abuse and probably physical abuse and other forms of abuse uh, in, in the same time So, because they, similar things apply to all forms of abuse. And, uh, and we can give more information about that then. Mm -hmm. But it's very important that a person does not feel that they are to blame for being abused. Yeah. A very basic fundamental truth. You are never to blame for being abused, yeah. ever. <laughs> Our next question is from Miranda. Mm -hmm. And it's a little lengthy, so I'll read through it sure. and then... Then we can discuss it. Yep. She says, I'm reading an excellent book called Healing Developmental Trauma. How early trauma affects self-regulation, self-image and the capacity for relationship. In part two, it talks about how the traumas of neglected basic developmental needs and abuse affect the brain, endocrine system, chemical balance, etc. Mm. Mm -hmm. It cautions therapists to take the patient slowly through their healing process, especially when there has been severe traumas and abuses. From what I've read of, in a few similar books, John Bradshaw's Homecoming included, they seem to be missing a point between understanding how the soul damage is created and the healing, mm -hmm. or so how the healing takes place. Mm -hmm. With psychotherapy, it seems to take a long time and many sessions for people to become healed. Mm -hmm. From my experience, when people's, mine included, causal emotions are truly released, the law of attraction changed almost instantly, within 24 hours sometimes. Mm. Would the chemical imbalance be corrected as rapidly as a result of this deep healing, or would that take time, as creating synapses or grooves in the brain usually happens over time? And if it is not happening instantly, how could the transformation still happen with no relapse? In the case of a person who went through repentance, how lasting would the change be? I noticed that when repentance happened, the changes are much more profound. Mm. Is it safe to say that there's no need to concern ourselves with the chemical imbalance and simply trust that a person will go where they need to go in their emotional processing to the, to the degree of, their, of the desire, their desire to feel? Mm. Well, I feel this is a very good question, Miranda, and mm -hmm. as a therapist, she's a therapist, I know, so, um, you know, she's got quite a lot of emo background about therapy and she's seen the positive benefits of, of applying the principles of how the human soul functions to her own therapy. So I think we need to probably dissect this entire question. Yes. So let's do that. Okay. Mm. <clears throat> so... Firstly, she talks about a whole series of books, um, some of which are well known, regarding the effect of trauma in your childhood and how it affects the physical aspects of the regulation of your brain, your endocrine system, your chemical balance and, and even your muscular and, and skeletal systems. And it does affect all of those things. Yeah. So yes, all of this early childhood trauma does affect 
your entire body, of course, because it affects your soul and your soul is connected to your body. And so everywhere there is a blockage of some emotion and usually inside of a person who's, who's experienced trauma as a child, a lot of trauma in particular, um, and, and if it's been, you know, systematic trauma, like usually sexual abuse is, then of course there are going to be lots of different areas of blockages inside of the soul. Mm -hmm. So in other words, there's going to be energy locked up inside of the soul in lots of different areas of the soul, which will then reflect in the spirit and physical bodies. So you're going to have all aspects of your physical and, and, and spiritual bodies being affected. And because most of this trauma occurred during your developmental years, from the ages before se up to seven years of age, it means that uh, many of these are uh, belief systems that are well established inside of your memory and therefore also well established inside of your brain in terms of how your brain works even. Yeah. So, so all of these things, of course, are true. Mm -hmm. They're all true and they've been proven, I feel, scientifically at this point in time to be true. Yeah. The problem where it all goes awry is, is where we start attributing certain potential causes to these effects. And this is where I feel the medical profession goes out of harmony with the development of scientific fact. Mm -hmm. We can only make statements of scientific fact or... We are just basically, you know, wandering around in the dark. And I feel a lot of the times what happens with, with scientists and, and med the medical profession is a scientific profession is they measure a whole series of effects and then they postulate as to what the causes may be yep. rather than knowing what the causes are. Mm -hmm. Now, once you start to understand how the human soul functions, you realise that everything that's happening in the physical body is about the denial of something that's happening in your soul. So everything negative or uh, unhealthy Every, that's happening in the body? Everything. Yeah. Everything, including negative belief systems, mm -hmm. are all the result. They're not the result of chemical imbalances in the brain. They cause chemical imbalances yes. in the brain. So the, the, the chemical imbalances in the brain are the effect of Mm -hmm. these soul-based locked up emotions, not the other way around. Mm -hmm. And these soul-based locked up emotions cause physical problems in the body. They cause also physical problems in the spirit body. They cause problems with the flow of energy. And anybody who's used to any kind of Eastern or Ch Chinese type of medicine would know that, that emotions prevent the flow of cer certain spirit that they can see in the spirit body prevent the flow of energy in the material body. So therefore, the material body gets affected by, and therefore, not only affected by, but, but unfortunately harmed by the locked up emotions. Now, they also know, many people in Eastern uh, medical professions know, that there is also the attraction of entities. They call them entities, not mm -hmm. spirits, people, but they call them entities from what they call other worlds or whatever, but really they're just spirits who are attracted to these particular injuries who also exacerbate the problem for the person who's gone through these particular traumas. And many times these people have, have influenced the people on earth, many of these spirits have influenced the people on earth during the developmental years of their, of their life. And that, of course, also then means that they are greatly influencing the flow of energy in their body as well. Yeah. So we have all of these combined issues and problems. Mm -hmm. now, now, to then assume that we must go slowly and be careful and all of these other presumptions, there, there's now no scientific evidence for those presumptions, right? There, are, there is a lot of anecdotal evidence because most people who have had trauma during their childhood experience have a lot of deep resistance to experiencing the emotion. Most people who experience childhood trauma want there to be another solution other than feeling their childhood trauma-based emotions. Yep. So they are in a mode already where they want to avoid the experience of these emotions. Since they want to avoid the experience of these emotions, they often are overcloaked or influenced by spirits during the processing of these emotions. As a result, the therapist measures that avoidance through the 
the, the psychotic, if you like, episode that the person who's going through the emotion might have experienced and the therapist becomes very concerned and therefore says we need to be very, very careful and we need to take it very slow. But that's without a complete understanding of what's going on. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, there are no scientific or psychological journals on the planet today that actually know what's going on mm -hmm. in, complete, in, in, in a, a, in a picture. holistic picture yeah. of what's going on, particularly for early developmental trauma, mm -hmm. but for all forms of trauma, actually. And, and because we don't know, because that nobody knows, they're all very frightened and therefore they want to take a lot of very, you know, careful consideration. And that, of course, means that there is a very slow process of recovery, if any recovery at all, that mm -hmm. many of these people who have experienced childhood developmental trauma, um, ha you know, many of them don't never recover their entire life or they find their life difficult for most of their life, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be that way. But to not be that way, it requires understanding the soul. Mm -hmm. And this is where I feel every single person who's, in who's doing therapy needs to understand how the human soul functions. Mm -hmm. And we've pointed people all the way through these discussions about emotions, we've pointed them to the series about how the human soul functions. It is an essential piece of material for any therapist, psychologist, psychiatrist, any person who's involved in therapy, any life coach, all of, all of those people involved in those industries need to examine how the human soul functions if they're truly going to have a positive effect on a person. Mm -hmm. Now, Miranda then raises the issue of what happens in her experience and what she has found is actually true. And that is that you don't have to concern yourself about going slowly at, at all. What you need to concern yourself with is the willingness of the patient to actually feel the emotion that occurred during, during their trauma. Mm -hmm. Most patients are unwilling when they begin. Now, because they're unwilling when they begin, because they're afraid of their emotions, they're afraid of how traumatic these emotions are and so forth, there is a high likelihood, at, particularly at the beginning, that if you take them through a process they are unwilling to follow, that they will withdraw from the process and during that time become overcloaked by spirits who, who get involved in the process with them. Mm -hmm. In other words, there's a higher likelihood of them reverting to psychosis or psychotic behaviour during that period of time. Right. If the patient's completely willing emotionally to experience their emotions, there is no danger at all of that occurring. Mm -hmm. And if they allow the emotional experience, as Miranda has found during her own therapist sessions with other people, they will release the causal emotion and their life will instantly demonstrate the change. Now, yeah. it's instant. Now, even though most people only observe it over 24 hours or 48 hours, it's actually an instant change that's occurred in the soul. Now, from that moment on, any physical or psychological or intellectual impairment that has occurred due to that emotion that has been locked up all of that person's life during their life, yep. all of that, all of that, uh, any of that impairment related specifically to the emotion yep. that's been released will also begin its recovery. So it's not instantaneous. But it begins. Well, there are some systems in the in the in the body that are instantaneous, yep. or relatively instantaneous, yep. that will occur over the next few hours. Yep. Does that make sense? Yep. Then there are other systems that take days. Yep. There's other systems that take weeks. Some take months, and some take up to seven years. Yes. So so it just depends on which system we're talking about as to how long the recovery will actually take. Yep. Uh, clarifier. Yep. So Miranda in her question poses that if this takes time, why don't, isn't there a, 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 um, a danger of relapse? Because, and this is where she's viewing the physical body as the thing that is directing how Correct. the emotion flows. This is because of her misunderstanding about the soul. Yep. Everything comes from the soul. 
So there is no danger of a relapse unless the person imbibed the same emotion that they had. And the likelihood of them doing that is very highly unlikely. Yep. So there is highly unlikely they will relapse. So when we release something causally, mm -hmm. the change happens in our soul. Instantly. And, well, perhaps we should rewind and recap what you said. Yeah. You said as a child, yes. things are, when there's trauma thing, and that's suppressed, things are retained in the soul. As energy locked up. As energy locked up. They're not being felt as emotion. Yep. They're just energy locked up, not in motion. And this affects the spirit body and the physical body. Yes. So the cause of any issue yes. is in the soul and yes. that's reflected in the spirit and physical body. So Correct. these things that she's talking about, about the endocrinogic, Endo end, endocrine system. system and um, chemical balances in the brain, the synapses even in the, the brain, the way you think. The way the, you think even is completely changed. The formation of the, the formation brain. The formation of your cells, the damage done to each individual cell in different locations, the different problems you have in different parts of your body. All of these things are the subsequent result of the suppression of the emotion from the child. Yeah. So they are the effect. They're not governing what happens to the emotion. They are the grooves, if you like, that are formed because of the soul's decision to deal with the emotion in a certain way. Yes, and because they're not governing... They, and because they are the effects, they have no governance over the recovery. Yes. Once we recover the soul, then even though the grooves in the brain that she refers to or the functioning of the synapses might yep. still be in a certain way, because the soul has changed, this will gradually create the change in the brain. But the brain is not going to dominate the soul. No. No. And, and many parts of your body change very rapidly, usually within the first 24 to 48 hours. Yeah. And so, and so you will have a large benefit that you will feel in your body, usually within the first 48 hours. And then there are other systems in your body that take much, much longer to recover. Mm -hmm. And so therefore will take a longer time and you'll need to drink a lot of water and do things to help your body do that, of course, because there's a lot of toxins now that are going to come out of your body. A lot, a lot of your body's systems will begin operating r correctly. Yes. And as a result, they'll start repairing this long-term problem. And of course, any long-term problem has a lot, a lot of a build-up of long-term issues inside of the body that need to be repaired, and that repair process may take anywhere from hours to years. Yeah. Uh, uh, anywhere up to seven, in fact, mm -hmm. years, uh, depending on what system you're talking about. Now, all of what I said applies unless you've received divine love. <laughs> when you receive divine love. And particularly once you become at one with God, all of your systems in your body are automatically in harmony with that love. So this is how a person who's a healer, who is at one with God, so there's no one on earth in that condition at the moment, but a person who isn't a, he, is a healer, who is at one with God, can instantly heal certain parts of the body once a person is willing to experience certain emotions associated with the injury in that part of the body. Mm -hmm. So you're saying whereas we might through our own will decide to feel those emotions, release them from the soul, and there'll be a gradual change in the physical body. Yes, when, and when I say gradual, it may be gradual hours right the way through to years. Yep. yep. When a person who actually heals using divine love, then the, we still must be willing to release the emotion, and if we do, then the changes in the physical body are instantaneous. Yes, because God's love is able to be used as the healing mechanism of, of the systems affected by that particular emotion. Mm -hmm. So this is how I healed things in the first century. And, and this is how anyone who becomes at one with God can heal other people. Yeah. Of course, there needs to be a willingness inside of the person to address the underlying emotional issues. And that's where most people, you know, that's, why we're try, that's why we're spending this time <laughs> on emotions, because we need to help people come to, to accept the importance of working through and addressing their emotions in terms of even somebody else coming along at some phase, stage in the future and helping them be healed. Yeah. Mm. yeah. There needs to be internally a willingness, you see. And what I, and her, her last statement, I feel, is the important statement. So maybe if you read that again. And... Is it safe to say that there's no need to concern ourselves with the chemical imbalance mm -hmm. and simply trust that a person will go where they need to go in their emotional processing to the degree of their desire to feel. Correct. That is correct. The person will go where they need to go in their processing 
directly proportional to their <laughs> desire to feel. feel. And this is, where, um, this is where therapists can help a person greatly. It's about attempting to help the person understand the way the soul works and the way the physical and material body, the physical and spiritual bodies are affected by the soul. So this is a way you can educate people as a therapist. But also the primary education that needs to occur from the therapist to the patient is the education about their will, the exercise of their true desire to feel. Mm -hmm. and, and many people, as I've said right at the beginning of this answer to this question, many people who have had early childhood trauma have very little desire to feel it. And this is why so many damaging results occur when a person goes to a therapist, because they are actually in this lack of desire to feel it still. They want their life to be fixed without having to go through the feelings. So they want some kind of chemical solution, medical solution, some therapist to wave their magic wand and come up with a solution, but they don't want to have to go through the emotional experience. Yeah. And this is the primary problem mm -hmm. that causes things like psychotic behaviour during, uh, during the process of trying to help a person through traumatic memories. Yeah. So, so what I'm suggesting to people is if you can, it's not good to push the patient mm -hmm. into, a, into being willing to do something they are obviously not willing to do, but you can educate them about their willingness yeah. and the need for them to develop a willingness inside of them. And will is like a muscle that needs to be exercised, as we'll talk about many times in the future. Yeah. And so what we need to do is help them see that they can develop their will and grow their will to start to experience and release many of these emotions that they are now safe to experience, even though they weren't safe to experience them as a child. Mm -hmm. And once you do that, there is little danger of them, and, and no danger in fact at all, of them ever being harmed by spirits or some psychotic episode, which is usually triggered by spirits in some way, um, through their therapy process. And so that means that people don't have to worry about how fast it goes. Yeah. How fast it goes will be dependent completely upon the will of the patient. Yeah. And that's the way it should be, in mm -hmm. fact. And what we can do is help the patient have a developed will. So they want to go through it yeah. rather than looking for some magical solution to the problem. What are the original causes of fears and terrors that now seem to dominate the planet? Well, the answer to this question is quite simple, really, in a lot of ways. And that is, <clears throat> fear is the direct result of us not understanding the truth. So all of our terror and all of our fear that now dominates the planet is due to the fact that we don't know the truth about how the universe works and how everything runs. And the main reason why we don't know the truth is because we've accepted the lie mm -hmm. and we believe the lies are true. And that's really what fear is. Fear is false appearing real. Yeah. So, so what we've done is we've actually created a, an unreality, if you like, from God's perspective, We've then called it real mm -hmm. and then, of course, we're going to have lots and lots of fears and terrors associated with it. Now, this began through the process of Amon and Amman, the, the first human couple, decided to m make the first step into untruth. And the first step into untruth was that we could be gods. Mm -hmm. In other words, we could be not just self-determining beings, which was what God created us to be with free will, but rather godlike or gods in that we could actually tell god what to do. we could tell god what to do we could create our own laws we could create our own and this and this idea or concept was the was the first inception of a lot of lies of a lot of errors but with every error comes the penalty of the pain of the error and the pain of the error is always fear there's always fear associated with the pain of any error mm -hmm. And this is the problem, is that every time we deny truth, fear is automatically created on that particular subject. Now, what's happened over many, many tens of thousands of years historically now is that initially man created the monster error, was that, <laughs> which was 
that we could be God or we could be gods, right? That's the monster error. You know, there's only one God, there only ever will be one God and there'll only ever be one creator of our entire universe and we're never going to be gods. We may become very much God-like in our nature and personality and so forth, but in the end we'll all be dependent upon the laws that God's already constructed and created. The real God created these laws in the universe so that anarchy couldn't exist. Yeah. And, and what happened was mankind, or humankind, stepped into anarchy. And in that process of stepping into anarchy, a lot of untruths began to be taught. Mm -hmm. The first untruth being that we can be God. Mm -hmm. And then, it began, then, of course, that's a pretty monster untruth. And, of course, that then means that any other smaller untruth is much more easily accepted. Yeah. And so what happened very rapidly historically is that this monster untruth, which was the beginning of all the untruths taught, um, began to be taught and, and, and encouraged. And each untruth begets another generally. Yep. And eventually each fear creates more untruths as well because the, the, un, the fear created by the previous untruth then has the problem of creating another untruth generally. This is the problem with fear, with lies. You have to lie more in order to maintain the reality you've now constructed, mm. right? And the problem with this process is that it's been an a going, ongoing process since the first human couple, and it very rapidly came into being as a result of the big monster untruth that was told right for, at the oh, first. I love that. I want to call it the big monster untruth. It's far more uh, yeah. exciting than the original sin. It is the biggest <laughs> untruth that still affects humanity today and it's the biggest untruth that affects our development of becoming at one with God. It, it stops us from becoming at one with God. And, and so it's a monster untruth, right? And, and, and this big untruth, the biggest one of all, caused then our ability to accept other untruths, mm -hmm. which are smaller but, but just as dangerous. And as each untruth becomes accepted, it, be, it becomes the lie appearing real. It's yeah. fear. It's yeah. fear now. And every single fear now that occurs is occurring because of all of these untruths that everyone believes to be true. Yeah. Now, that is the major cause of all of the world's untruth, all of the world's problems with regard to fear and terror are all caused by the fact that very few of us now know the truth, God's truth we're talking about now. If all of us knew God's truth, and we really felt it because the only way to know God's truth is in your heart, in your soul, and we really felt it, there would be no fear mm -hmm. at all. There would be no terror at all. We would not experience terror. Even if someone tried to murder us, we wouldn't feel terror because all, once we have all of these truths inside of our soul, we are not afraid of anything anymore. Also, we would be in a state of love with God, like we would be receiving God's love and we'd be at one with God in that location. And as a result we would be also knowing that we're loved. So the other error, and the other untruth that you're not worth anything, mm -hmm. would not be possible to enter us. And so we would not walk around as we do today believing that we're hard, but to blame for a lot of things that we never did and that uh, other people are to blame for things that we did. <laughs> Both of them come from the same primary cause. Yeah. And none of those things would be occurring either. So, so we need to start seeing that all of this fear and terror that's on the planet is the direct result of our acceptance of lies. Yeah. Now, once a person understands that, they become a lot more dedicated to finding out the truth, not only about universal truth, but also about the truth about themselves. Mm. Because they understand that the problem associated with lies is it causes all fear causes all terror, causes all pain. Yeah. So, so every time you imbibe lies, you are automatically, automatically going to create pain, mm. automatically. Mm. And you're automatically going to create suffering and therefore you're automatically going to create fear and terror. You said every time we imbibe lies, so every time we accept them as, as truths, true. as a false belief. Mm. What about every time we just allow them or accept them? Well, that's or... imbibing a lie too. Yep. Why would we ever allow a lie? 
you know, it's only because we've already allowed another lie, which is that you, you're not allowed to speak up about lies. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, or we might have beliefs that, you know, you tell the truth and it's painful. No, it's not painful. Lies are painful. Mm-hmm. We need to get, uh, you know, these fundamental principles about God's truth right. Lies are painful. Truth is never painful. Yeah. Truth never causes pain, ever. Truth exposes the pain you're already in because of the lies you accepted. You know, so, so for example, a man who's cheated on his wife, he has, by not telling her the truth, caused her to accept a lie. Mm-hmm. It's the lie that's going to cause her pain. If he never cheated on her, there'd be no pain. Yeah. Right, he cheated on her, he lied to her. There's now going to be two pains, the fact that he cheated and also the fact that he lied. Mm-hmm. And, and, and both are untruth. Both are based on untruths. He did it for reasons that are not justifiable ever. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, he needs to work his way through whatever that is. But every time you choose to do these things and avoid, and avoid the truth, you are causing error and pain. You're causing pain, suffering. You're causing terror on the planet. Yeah. And this is why I keep saying to people who listen to divine truth, mm-hmm. the importance of living in truth is, is the most important thing you can choose to do. Every time you withhold truth, every time you step away from it, every time you avoid it, every time you lie, every time you perpetrate another lie on this planet, you are going to cause pain to yourself, you're going to cause pain to others, you're going to create fear and you're going to create terror. It doesn't matter what you did it for and what reason you did it for, they are always going to be the results and that's what we need to see. So, so this is the primary cause and, and we need to see it as the primary cause if we're ever really going to become truthful ourselves and if we're ever going to become a healer to the planet, we need to understand that basic principle that every time we lie, allow the lie, allow it to perpetrate, every time we lie to ourselves, every time we lie to others, every time we lie to God, every time we do all of these things, we are just perpetrating more fear, more terror more problems, more pain, more mm-hmm. suffering, mm-hmm. and we've got to stop. <laughs> and we've got to stop even if we're only the first one who stops. <laughs> yeah. And even if everybody attacks us, we've still got to stop <laughs> because without st- st- stopping, we're never going to stop the, the continual cycle of this multi-generational fear and terror which pervades society. Mm. Mm. Thank you. Fear is so destructive. I don't even think I realise the extent of that yet. Is that what somebody says? This is, yeah. <laughs> so this person is asking this question. Yeah. Um, I don't think hardly anybody on the planet realises the extent <laughs> of it. How destructive it is, no. <laughs> so the question really is, why do we let it run our personal lives and what seems like the entire world? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> that was a quick question. Well, I do know that. <laughs> yeah, it makes no logical sense to to let it run our lives or run the entire world. It makes no logical sense at all. Of course, unfortunately, a lot of what we do isn't logical because it's driven by pain, uh, pain that we don't want to feel. Mm. So, so the reason why we allow it to run the world and the reason why we allow it to run our lives is because we're unwilling to feel pain. We're unwilling to accept truth. So, so as we talked about in one of the questions in this session, truth is the antidote, an, antidote. antidote to fear. Truth, truth is what causes all fear to disappear. So, so the reality is if we're, we're letting the world run by fear and our own personal lives run by fear, it's because we have a very strong aversion to truth. Mm. And we need to look at that. We need to start examining that personally and as a society. We, we, what we're doing frequently is that we are accepting lies, we allow the perpetration of lies even though we don't believe them, and we like to create lies when it helps us avoid our own personal emotional pain. Yeah. And we've got to stop doing all of these things if we're ever going to have a fearless and, uh, and, uh, and a loving society. But, but it's all about truth. It's all about the acceptance of truth. And this is where I find people the most resistive. They are very resistive to personal truth, very resistive to personal truth. And many people in the world are also violently resistive to external truth. Mm -hmm. And and because we are so resistive to truth, 
fear and terror are the only results that are going to be created. Lies create fear and terror, not truth. Mm. Truth always exposes fear and terror. Truth always helps us be less afraid. And, and so this is what we need to see in our lives. So a lot of people want there to be another solution. They want, they want the solution to not be truth. But it is truth. Mm -hmm. Like once you come to know truth, it sets you free from almost everything, including fear and terror. Mm -hmm. And if your life is governed by fear and your, the world is governed by fear, it is because we are individually and collectively unable and unwilling to receive truth. We don't want truth. And I see that as a big problem on the planet, the fact that we don't want truth. You just said we're unable to receive truth. Yeah, and unable because of our emotions. We go inside of us, we're going, I don't want that truth, I don't want that truth. Mm -hmm. It's going to make me feel some of the, it's going to expose some of the pain that I have inside of me and I feel like I'm unable to feel it yeah. and so I'm unable to receive it. Yeah. I'm not saying that we're unable in terms of like our soul is not yeah. able. Yeah. We are completely able to receive truth at any time that that's the way God designed us, but we create our own inability to receive mm -hmm. it by avoiding our own pain. Yeah. We, we don't want to experience our own pain, and so what we finish up doing is avoiding the truth. And, and then, of course, we complain about how much fear and terror our life's in, mm -hmm. but it's all because we've avoided a whole heap of truth. Yeah. When you accept truth, it's a lot easier. Uh, people have no idea how easy <laughs> your life is once you start really accepting truth and really loving the truth. And all of these fear-based responses are all the result of us avoiding truth. And so, I, like, I feel, again, the biggest issue about fear is your refusal to accept truth, whether that be universal truth or personal truth. Mm -hmm. And for the majority of us, we're a bit more open to universal truth than we are to personal truth. And although... I've seen many people react violently to the point where they're willing to go to war for either, mm. to hold on to a universal error or to hold on to a personal error. Yeah. And they're willing to go to war. And many, many people have died historically as a result of people wanting to hold on to those two things. And it's so sad that this is the case. Yeah. So that desire to hold on to those errors is really, it's a fear of receiving truth about those same things. It's not only a fear of receiving the truth, it's a direct desire to avoid receiving truth. So mm -hmm. it's not, now of course that's driven by fear, but it's also driven by things like anger yeah. and other emotions. So it's not quite as simple as just being related to fear perhaps, but, sure. but, but our avoidance of truth is the creator of all of the pain and, and unfortunately, we think that when we, get, we receive truth, we're actually feeling more pain. No, we're, the pain that we're already in is being exposed yep. to us. And that's how we need to see things if we're ever going to change anything on this planet. Mm -hmm. So that it mirrors some parts of the spirit world. Like mm. this parts of the spirit world where only truth exists. It, nobody lies. Nobody tells an untruth. Nobody fabricates anything. Nobody is in a facade. Like in the first sphere of the, of the celestial kingdom, that's what it's like. So there's places in the spirit world where there's, of course, no fear because there is no way for fear to exist because nobody believes any lies. That everyone wants to accept the truth. Everyone loves the truth. Everyone upholds it. Everyone honours it. Everyone values it. Everyone sees how great it is. Everyone understands it sets you free. Everyone understands it helps you experience your self and your will and your partner and God. And so none of them in those locations uh, want to avoid it. Mm -hmm. And when we want to avoid it, all we're doing is perpetrating more fear and more terror on the planet and in our personal lives. Mm. That's all we're doing when we're avoiding it. So this is where I feel sometimes quite sad when I feel audiences or groups of people that we're speaking to avoiding the truth of their personal life or avoiding a universal truth because I see, well, you know, you say you want to be a leader of, you know, reducing the fear on the planet. You say you want to be a leader of love on the planet. But what you're demonstrating to me is the only way fear can disappear is by you accepting some truth and you don't want to accept it. Yeah. So, so it's very sad when I see groups of people doing that because, it, because it, it, it's proof that it, they do not understand the reason why 
fear and terror exists. Mm -hmm. And if you don't understand the reason why it exists, you're never going to get rid of it. You know, we need to, the only way to get rid of it is to, to, to delete what we created, to, to destroy what we created. God didn't create it, so God can't destroy it. Mm -hmm. We created it historically and personally. We create this terror and fear inside of ourselves and, and we create it by accepting and imbibing and keeping false beliefs that we don't want to let go of. And these false beliefs are all emotional. They all come from our emotional parts of our soul. And what we've decided to do is, is avoid the experience of them and leave them in there. And when we do that, we, there is no hope for us to be, become a leader in love or a leader in truth under those circumstances. Mm. We've got to have some courage and, and face up to the truth and realise that the true cause of, all, of the majority, if not all, of our problems here is the monster lies that have been told. <laughs> and it's time that we started destroying them and getting rid of them, yeah. you know. And there's monster lies religiously, monster lies about God. The biggest monster lie is about ourselves, mm -hmm. you know, that we can be gods. Mm -hmm. You know, that's one of the biggest monster lies. But there's lies about God, there's lies about ourselves, there's lies about science, there's lies about religion, there's lies about emotions, there's lies about relationships, there's lies about parents, about children, about pretty much everything you can consider on the planet, there's a lie about it somewhere. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and, and this is why we have so much of this pain and suffering, which uh -huh. is a direct result of the fear and terror that we're in as a result of trying to avoid the truth. So holding on to the lies is creating the fear that we then let to run our lives. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So, so we need to understand that that's the reason. There's no other reason. There's no magical solution other than us destroying the lies we created. Mm. Yep. And, and when I say us, I mean humanity collectively destroying the lies we created.